All right, y'all, let's get straight into the interview. Vice President Kamala Harris sits down with Fox News. Never thought I would see today, but I'm glad she's doing it. Like I said, I have respect that she sat down and decided to do this interview. Now, I've I've watched a couple different perspectives, and obviously, from the Republican standpoint, they think that she absolutely did terrible in this interview. From the Democratic standpoint, they feel like it was a setup from the very beginning. So let's see. Because I feel like, you know what, I'm I'm pretty... I think I'm pretty even like I'm 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 able to look at things and 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 not get overly swayed to one side or the other. Um, I like to think I have a fair amount of, you know, discernment to be able to cut through the, the you know, the, the you know what to the truth. All right. So let's watch this and let's see what's going on. All right. Let's go. Madam Vice President, thank you for the time. Thank you. It's good to be with you, Brett. You know, voters tell pollsters all over the country and here in Pennsylvania that immigration is one of the key issues that they're looking at this election and specifically the influx of illegal immigrants from more than 150 countries. How many illegal immigrants would you estimate your administration has released into the country over the last three and a half years? Well, I'm glad you raised the issue of immigration because I agree with you. It is a, it is a topic of discussion that people want to rightly have. And you know what I'm going to talk about. Yeah, but right do you, now, just a number. Is, do you but, think it's but, one million, three million? Brett, let's just get to the point. Okay, the point is that we have a broken immigration system that needs to be repaired. So your and Homeland Security Secretary said that 85% well, no, of not finished, apprehensions. I'm not finished. We have a we have it's an a rough immigration estimate of system six million people have been released be, but, into the country. And let me just finish. I'll get to the question. I promise you. I was beginning to answer. And <laughs> when when you came into office, I will say this: it is pretty crazy from an interviewer's perspective to ask a question, not allow her to finish that answer, and then say. Let me just finish. From an interviewer's perspective, telling the person that you're interviewing, let me just finish right after you just asked the question is pretty insane. And look, she did say, let's just get straight to the, let's get straight to the point. We have a broken immigration system that needs to be fixed. And she was largely in charge of that, you know, system. So, you know, she is taking some accountability when you put it from that perspective, but clearly he has a point that he's trying to make in order to paint the narrative that he wants to paint during this interview. And, and that's, and this is the problem that I have with these interviews with these like major news, like Fox news, CNN, MSNBC, all these type of interviews. Just let the people talk, let the candidates talk, let them speak us as the people we can see through the BS. We can see through, you know, all the political talk and all the nonsense that they're going to say. Let her spew all of that out and let us sift through it and make decisions for ourselves. But it seems like all of these news companies, whether it's on the left or on the right, they all have an agenda that they want to push going into the interview as opposed to just letting the candidate speak and answer the questions that you are proposing. And maybe they'll answer the questions, maybe they won't. But once she starts dancing too much around the question and not getting to the point, then you can drill it home and drill down and really get to the, you know, the the meat of it. But I felt like that was too early for him to jump in and and confront her like that. Your administration immediately reversed a number of Trump border policies. Most significantly, the policy that required illegal immigrants to be detained through deportation, either in the U.S. or in Mexico. And you switched that policy. They were released from custody awaiting trial. So instead, included in those were a large number of single men, adult men, who went on to commit heinous crimes. So looking back, do you regret the decision to terminate Remain in Mexico at the beginning of your administration? At the beginning of our administration, within practically hours of taking the oath, the first bill that we offered Congress before we worked on infrastructure, before the Inflation Reduction Act, before the Chips and Science Act, before, any, before the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, the first bill, practically within hours of taking the oath, was a bill to fix our immigration system. Yes, ma'am. It was called and, the U.S. Citizen, and, Citizenship Act of 2021. Exactly. It was and, essentially and so, but, but a pathway I, I, to citizenship for the... Finish, yes, may, I finish, may I finish responding, but please? You, but, this, but you have to let me finish, You please. had the White House and the House and the Senate, I'm and they the didn't bring up that bill. He's talking too much. 
and it was a it was a, a fair question that he proposed like hey a large amount of people that you allowed into this country ended up cr committing crimes do you regret the decision that you made in order to allow these individuals into the country that ultimately harmed americans it's a good question that he posed but i mean i don't know if he's gonna let her speak <laughs> to the point you're raising, okay. and I'd like to finish. Yes, ma'am. We recognized from day one that to the point of this being your first question, it is a priority for us as a nation and for the American people. And our focus has been on fixing a problem. And from day one, then, we have done a number of things, including to address our asylum system and put more resources, getting more judges, what we needed to do to tighten up penalties and increase penalties for illegal crossings, what we needed to do to deal with ports, points of entry between border entry points. That's the work we did, and we worked on supporting what was a bipartisan effort, including some of the most conservative members of the United States Congress, to actually strengthen the border. That border bill would have put 1,500 more border agents at the border, which is why I believe the Border Patrol agents supported the bill. It would have allowed us to stem the flow of fentanyl coming into the United States, which is a scourge affecting people of every background, every geographic location in our country, killing people. It would have allowed us to put more resources into prosecuting transnational criminal organizations, which I have done yes, as the attorney general, former attorney general of a border state. Madam Vice President, a couple of things. Prosecuted trafficking of drugs, six, guns, and human beings. And Donald Democrats. Trump, but let me just finish. Six. Oh, my gosh. This is why I can't watch like mainstream news because of interactions like this. This is not a profitable interaction. This is like, this is one of those, let's get the most amount of ratings possible type of interaction. It doesn't feel to be like a genuine interaction. And that's why I like what's becoming the new mainstream media of like podcasting and you know, people who are doing long form interviews on YouTube and whatnot, because there's actual room for a conversation in long form. And these are issues, these are topics that us as voters, we deserve to have long form discussions readily available for us to dissect in order to make decisions in terms of who we want to vote for. But this is just like a reality TV show. Democrats Donald voted Trump against that bill. Learned about that bill and told them to kill it because he preferred to run on a problem instead of fixing a problem. And in this election. And I've heard her say that multiple times. She said that because this is the same thing that she mentioned in, in the debate. And I think when she sat down, whatever interview she did, I think was it with CNN or, or MSNBC, she said the same thing. She, she said that, you know, there was a bill in place that was going to essentially help the immigration situation. But Donald Trump killed it. I would like to know more about what she means when she says that. What exactly does that mean? What influence did Trump have outside of office that would allow him to kill this bill? As someone who's ignorant to politics... Like myself and many people, you know, let's, let's just keep it real. Many people are, are ignorant. There's 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 people who are pretty well versed, but for the most part, we're pretty ignorant. So what does that mean exactly when you say that? Because it would appear to us as outsiders looking in, you have power. You are the vice president. You have power. You have decision making power. You might not have all of the power, but you have some power. You have some influence. You have some relationships. So if this was a bill that you truly thought was going to be beneficial to help the border crisis, how come it didn't work out? These are the things I want to know. This is rightly a discussion that the American people want to have. And what they want are solutions. And they want a president of the United States who's not playing political games with the issue, I hear you. but actually is focused on fixing Six it. Six Democrats voted against that bill. It would have allowed 1.8 million illegal immigrants into the country a year. A lot, a lot of conservatives had a problem with it. These are the six Democrats. But more importantly, back to the original premise, Jocelyn. I want to know what exactly the bill is. That's what I want to know. What, what was that bill specifically? 
Gary, Rachel Morin, Lakin Riley, they are young women who were brutally assaulted and killed by some of the men who were released at the beginning of the administration, well before a negotiated uh, bipartisan bill. Former President Clinton actually referred to Lakin Riley Sunday campaigning for you in Georgia, saying if those men had been properly vetted, Lakin Riley probably would not have been killed. So if it wouldn't have happened, this is well before any negotiation. This is well before Donald Trump got involved in the politics. This is a specific policy decision by your administration to release these men into the country. So what I'm saying to you, no, do you no, no, owe Brett, those families really, think, an apology? Let me just say, first of all, those are tragic cases. There's no question about that. There is no question about that. And I can't imagine the pain that the families of those victims have experienced for a loss that should not have occurred. So that is true. It is also true that if a border security had actually been passed nine months ago, it would be nine months that we would have had more border agents at the border, more support for the folks who are working around the clock trying to hold it all together Madam Vice President. to ensure that no future... Man, let me interview Kamala. Kamala, hey, Kamala's people, if you're, if you're watching this, open invitation. Let's get in. Let's, let's have an interview. I'm the perfect person to do it. Because I know so little about politics that I'm going to ask all the questions and I'm going to let you respond. But I'm going to ask all the questions. But I'm going to let you respond. and I'm going to be respectful because I think we need to have actual conversations. We need to have actual conversations. And I genuinely want to have a conversation. And I don't have any, you know, any agenda or anything that I want to push. I don't have any outcomes that I'm looking, but I have questions. I want to know your response. And I think it's important to educate people on what exactly you mean by certain things that you're mentioning so that we have a well-rounded picture of what you actually stand for, because it's very difficult. It's very difficult at this day and age that we live in. We live in like a soundbite, a clip uh, generation. One soundbite here, one clip here. And then that's like the basis that we have to go on in order to vote for somebody. And as I said, she doesn't align with my belief system. She doesn't align with what's important to me when it comes to voting. But I still would love to have a conversation to further unpack that and really understand where she's coming from and what she believes would occur. And this election in 20 days will determine whether we have a president of the United States who actually cares more about fixing a problem, even if it is not to their political advantage in an election, because there was a solution, Brett. Madam Vice President, it was a policy decision in the early part of your administration. I will let one of the mothers talk about it. Take a listen. Because of the Biden-Harris administration open border policies catch and release, they were enrolled in the Alternatives to Detention program. This meant that they were released into the United States. It was not even a full three weeks later that they would take my daughter Jocelyn Nungare's life. I believe the Biden-Harris administration open border policies are responsible for the death of my daughter. That's the early days. So do you owe them an apology is what I I'm saying. I will tell you that I am so sorry for her loss. I am so sorry for her loss. Sincerely. But let's talk about what is happening right now with an individual who does not want to participate in solutions. Let's talk about that as well. But do you right. want to in in all fairness, I told you, I feel awful. For but what does that mean? What does that mean that he doesn't want to participate in solutions? In her family have experienced. During that time, you said repeatedly that the border was secure. When in your mind did it start becoming a crisis? I think it, we've had a broken immigration system transcending, by the way, Donald Trump. Okay, that's a good question administration even before let's let's all be honest about that i have no pride in saying that this is a perfect immigration system i've been clear i think we all are that it needs to be fixed we need more i was just down at the border talking with border agents and they will tell you and i'm sure you probably i know you investigate and you are a serious journalist they will tell you we need more judges we need to process we need to process those cases faster we need the support for those cases that should be prosecuted 
They need more resources. And Congress ultimately is the only place that that's going to get fixed, Brett. Well, that's how the system that's, works. That's the premise that's, of this question. But there were 90 the plus works. executive orders that were rescinded in the first days. Many of those were Trump border policies. I'm not going to stay here because there's other things to talk about. But you frequently talk to the Border Patrol Union for support of that bipartisan bill, and they did. They supported it. But they also just endorsed Donald Trump and said, you've been, quote, a failure with border security. Why do you think they said that? I think they're frustrated, and I get it. They want support. They want support, and that's what that border security bill would have done. These guys down at the border, these men and women, they're working hard. They're working around the clock. I get it. There's a lot. So, what exactly are we going to do moving forward to fix this problem, to ensure that we don't encounter the same issues that we're encountering at this current moment and in the past, as it relates to the border? I look back at what you said in 2019 when you first ran for president. Uh, and there have been changes, and you've talked Bro, about I'm saying, like, come on, let me inter Kamala, hey, Kamala, come pull up. I got a studio right here, two chairs, professional quality, all right? Bring, pull up, bring the Secret Service, obviously. I got espresso machine, all right? We'll get some donuts. Let's, let's, let's talk. We, I got a predominantly Christian audience, which I don't know how well she's doing. From that side of it because we're more christian you know right-leaning audience this is perfect this is perfect comma hey kamala's team hit my email i'm serious that would be that you know how that would be amazing that would be amazing that would be we could talk about everything we could talk about the border we could talk about abortion we could talk about your faith we could talk about Trump, we could talk literally whatever you want to talk about. But, A, let's make it happen. Some of them. When it comes to immigration, you supported allowing immigrants in the country illegally to apply for driver's license, to qualify for free tuition at universities, to be enrolled in free health care. Do you su still support those things? Listen, that was five years ago, and I'm very clear that I will follow the law. I have made that statement over and over again, and as Vice President of the United States, that's exactly what I've done, not to mention before. You, if that's the case, you chose a running mate, Tim Walz, who, governor of Minnesota, who signed those very things into state law. So do you support that? We are very clear, and I am very clear, as is Tim Walz, that we must support and enforce federal law, and that is exactly what we will do. So decriminalizing border crossings, like you said in 2019. I, I do not believe in decriminalizing border crossings, and I've not done that as vice president, and I will not do that as president. So these are evolutions I, and, and, that but, you've had. But let's be very clear. I'm the only person who's running for president who has prosecuted transnational criminal organizations, from the Sinaloa cartel to the Guadalajara quota, cartel to people who have trafficked in guns, drugs, and human beings. I have spent a significant part of my career going after people who present a threat to the safety of the American people and, and cross our border with the intent of doing us harm and cross our border illegally. And I will do that work as vice president. I take that work quite seriously. This is a time when voters, especially here in Pennsylvania, are inundated with commercials and ads. They just want it to stop because it's every commercial. But many of them add noise, but a few of them seem to break through. This particular one from the Trump campaign has gotten a lot of attention. Kamala supports taxpayer-funded sex changes for prisoners. Surgery. Um, for prisoners. For prisoners. This is actually like a very intriguing, interesting ad. They play this a lot during football on Sunday. It's a very attention-grabbing ad. Every transgender inmate in the prison system would have access. So are you still in support of using taxpayer dollars to help prison inmates or detained illegal aliens to transition to another gender? I will follow the law. And it's a law that Donald Trump actually followed. Um, you're probably familiar with, now it's a public report, that under Donald Trump's administration, these uh, surgeries were available to, on a medical necess necessity basis, to people in the federal prison system. And I think, frankly, that ad from the Trump campaign is a little bit of like throwing you know, stones when you're living in a glass house. The Trump aides I'm more, in, I'm more interested in how, why are we here in the first place? Why are we, quote unquote, changing gender in the first place? That's what I'm more interested in. This is just a byproduct of the deeper issues that need to be addressed. That's what I'm more interested in.
that he never advocated for that prison policy and no gender transition well, surgeries happened during his Well, you know what, you got to take responsible his, for what happened presidency. in your administration. Yeah, no surgeries happened in his pre it's, presidency. It's so would you still advocate for using taxpayer dollars for gender reassignment surgeries? I will surgeries? follow the law, just as I, I, well, I think Donald Trump as, would say he did. You would have a say as president. I, like I said, I think it's real. He spent $20 million on those ads trying to create a sense of fear in the voters because he actually has no plan in this election that is about focusing on the needs of the American people. Whereas... At twenty million dollars on that ad, on an issue that, as it relates to the biggest issues that affect the American people, is really quite remote. And again, his policy was no different. Look at where we are, though. They on say plans for the American we'll people, I'm offering a plan to deal with affordable housing. I'm offering a plan to deal with what we need to do to strengthen small businesses, which are the backbone of America's economy. I am offering a plan that is about taking care of young parents and giving them the support they need. My plans for the economy will strengthen the economy, as have been reviewed by 16 Nobel laureates, uh, Goldman Sachs, Moody's, and recently the Wall Street Journal, which have all studied our plans and have indicated my plans for our economy would strengthen our economy, his would make them weaker, why do you would think ignite more people inflation say, and invite a recession by the middle of next year. Those you, are the facts. Why do you think more people say they trust him on the economy than they trust you? I think that when you look at an analysis of our plans for what we would do as President of the United States, it has been clear to those who study and understand how economic policy works that moving forward, because I do believe the American people are ready to turn the page on the divisiveness and the, the type of rhetoric that has come out of Donald Trump, people are ready to chart a new way forward, and they want a president who has a plan for the future and a plan that is sound and will strengthen our country. My plan for the economy does exactly that. His plan would be, again, to give tax cuts to billionaires. And you the know what's something? I, I, didn't, I never really hear them talking about it. Maybe they do. I, I haven't heard them talk about it. Even in the, in the debate, I haven't heard them talk about it. How come nobody talks about the debt crisis? How come nobody talks about that? How come nobody talks about that? Have you guys seen this? USdebtclock.org. Do you see this number? US national debt. This is this is real time. This is real time, right? That's how much is that? $35 trillion in US national debt. $35 trillion. How come nobody talks about that? What are we going to do about this? I'm very curious. What, 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 what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Because when you look at it, the largest budget items, you've got Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, Defense, and then the interest on that debt. How are we going to get out of this? <laughs> How are we going to get out? Because what are we going to do? Just print more money? Because that's their plan, essentially. Their plan is to print more money. But in printing more money to pay off the debt and to just pay off the interest of the debt, we're actively devaluing our dollar so i'm just i don't know i just i haven't heard anyone really talk about it and it's it's strange to me you know we have a, a presidential election and nobody's talking about 35 trillion dollars of debt corporations in our country and blow up our deficit it's interesting you said turn the page madam vice president you were asked on two different shows last week what if anything you would do differently than president biden here's yeah. what you said would you have done something differently than president biden during the past four years, uh, there is not a thing that comes that's a great question to mind in terms of and I've been a part of of, of most there's of not a thing that comes to mind. That's concerning. There's not a single thing that comes to your mind. I don't believe that. The decisions that have had impact under a Harris administration. I, I understand the respect level because he's your boss. Essentially, I understand the respect level. But you can respectfully disagree with somebody. Would the major changes be? And what would stay the same? Sure. Well, I mean, I'm obviously not Joe Biden. Um, I know. And so yes. that would be one change yes. in terms of. Yes. But also, it, I think it's important to say with, you know, 28 days to go, I'm not Donald Trump. So you're not Joe Biden. You're not Donald Trump. But, but nothing comes to mind that you would do differently? Let me be very clear. 
my presidency will not be a continuation of Joe Biden's presidency. And like every new president that comes in to office, I will bring my life experiences, my professional experiences, and fresh and new ideas. I represent a new generation of leadership. I, for example, am someone who has not spent the majority of my career in Washington, D.C. I invite ideas, whether it be from the Republicans who are supporting me, who were just on stage with me minutes ago, and the business sector, and others who can contribute to the decisions that I make about, for example, my plan for increasing the supply of housing in America and bringing down the cost of housing, addressing the issue of small businesses, which is about working with the private sector to bring more capital and access to capital to our small business leaders, including my plan for a $25,000 down payment assistance for first time home buyers we've, and for small businesses extending the tax deduction from $5,000 to $50,000. dollars we have heard a lot about those plans in, in recent days. Your campaign slogan is a new way forward and it's time to turn the page. You've been vice president for three and a half years. So what are you turning the page from? Well, first of all, turning the page from the last decade in which we have been burdened with the kind of rhetoric coming from Donald Trump that has been designed and implemented to divide our country and have Americans literally point fingers at each other. Rhetoric and an approach to leadership that suggests that the strength of a leader is based on who you beat down instead of what we all know. The strength of leadership is based on who you lift up. You, the strength Madam of an Vice American president. president, which is one who understands that the vast majority of us have more in common than what separates us. Madam that Vice is President, more than 70% of people That is about turning the page on rhetoric that people are frankly exhausted of, Brett. More than 70% of people tell the country is on the wrong track. They say the country is on the wrong track. If it's on the wrong track, that track follows three and a half years of you being vice president and President Biden being president. That is what they're saying, 79% of them. Why are they saying that? If you're turning the page, you've been in office for three and a half years. And Donald Trump has been running for office. But you've been the person been, holding on, the office, come on. Madam you Vice President. You and I both know what I'm talking about. You and I both know what I'm talking about. I actually about. don't. What are you talking about? What I'm talking about is that over the last decade, but people have become... Power. But listen, over the last decade, it is clear to me, and certainly the Republicans who are on stage with me, the, the, the former chief of staff to the president, Donald Trump, uh, former defense secretaries, national security advisor, and his vice president, one that he is unfit to serve, that he is unstable, that he is dangerous, and that people are exhausted with someone who professes to be a leader who spends full time demeaning and, and, and engaging in personal grievances and it being about him Madam instead Vice of President, the American people. People are case, tired of that. If that's the case, why is half the country supporting him? Why is he beating you in a lot of swing states? Why, if he's as bad as you say, that half of this country is now supporting this person who could be the 47th president of the United States? Why is that happening? This is an election for president of the United States. It's not supposed to be easy. I know, but it's if not it's supposed as... to be. It, it, it is not supposed to be a cakewalk for So are they misguided? The fifty percent? Are they stupid? What, oh what God, is it? I would never say that about the American people. And in fact, if you listen to Donald Trump, if you watch any of his rallies, he's the one who tends to demean and belittle and diminish. The American people, he's the one who talks about an enemy within, within, an enemy within, talking about the American people, suggesting he would turn the American military on the American people. We asked that the question to the former president today. Harris Faulkner had a, a town hall. Okay. Y'all could finish this on your own time if you want to finish it on your own time. I just, I like when, you know, interviewers, they give space for the person that, to answer the question. And because he has a lot of notes and, and, and there's nothing wrong with notes. But sometimes when you just have so many notes, you can't even really get lost in the current conversation and just be a human and just have a conversation because you have to get back to your track. So as I said, Kamala Harris. And this is how he responds. Let's do it. We gonna do it. We gonna sit down right here. Bring the Secret Service. Go ahead. Do all your background checks. All I'm. I let's do it. I'm ready. <laughs> we gonna pray. We definitely gonna pray. We are definitely going to pray before we we talk. Definitely. And we gonna get into it. And I'm not gonna sit here and 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 argue and go back and forth. It's gonna be respectful, but we're gonna talk about some hard topics. But I'm going to give you the space to lay out exactly how you feel in a comfortable environment, but in a real spirit led environment. That's my plea. 
hey, y'all make this happen. Y'all go make this happen in the comments. Y'all go do what you got to do. Make it happen. Make it happen. All right? All right. <laughs> That's it, y'all. Let me know what you think in the comments. I'm out, y'all.